come Cortana. Hey man. Hey. Oh, that's a neat shirt. Yeah, it's the new Death Battle shirt uh, available now in the Roosty store. Oh, that's neat. Yeah, everybody loves it. Really? Like who? Oh, well then. Hey, I'm Master Chief, and this shirt's the best thing I've ever worn. It's so soft. I wish I was in Death Battle. What do you think, Jocelyn the Intern? Speechless. The new Death Battle shirt, available now in Rooster Teeth store. Oh, I know you loved it. I do too. One of our most requested fights here at Death Battle is easily Marvel Comics versus DC Comics. Of course, it would be a huge undertaking and wicked time consuming. <laughs> However, in order to sate your hunger, let me tell you about the time they already fought. I'm Jocelyn the Intern, I do all the research nobody else wants to, straight from the desk of Death Battle! So, if you haven't been reading comics for years, you probably don't know that the whole DC versus Marvel thing actually happened already. Yeah, many, many years ago, in a time when the Dallas Cowboys could actually win a Super Bowl, and Chandler and Monica bumpin' uglies was merely fanfiction. <clears throat> my my fanfiction, specifically. If you read that online, that I, I wrote that, that was me. The two comic juggernauts came together at last. Luckily for us, instead of all the big bads and goody goods teaming up for an extra big super ordinary battle of good versus evil, DC and Marvel had something else in mind. Individual fights. The decision to pit their beloved heroes and villains against each other was exactly what we wanted. However, DC and Marvel had to get creative in order to do this because it obviously wouldn't make much narrative sense for someone like Captain America to fight Batman just because. On top of that, DC and Marvel have two fairly different versions of Earth. Where Marvel has the real world city of New York, DC has Gotham. So how did the two biggest comic brands in the world finally bring their characters together? <laughs> of course, duh, with a strange homeless man's cardboard box that spews out lasers. Yeah, you heard me right, a hobo's light-filled box is the first plot tool they chose to use for this highly anticipated crossover. <laughs> hobos. Anyway, as more and more magic light seeps out of our hobo house, more and more heroes and villains simply disappear without explanation. Seriously, even the narrator doesn't know what's going on. Obviously, they aren't disappearing, they're teleporting, and for some people, like Juggernaut, it's not such a nice experience. Seeing as he gets warped into DC's universe right at Superman's feet and fist. On the other side of things, Robin gets teleported to the Marvel side of things and finds himself in Jubilee's bed. <laughs> so, it's not all bad. Now, if I'm going a bit slow here, don't worry because the comic just launches ahead. Out of nowhere, we jump forward in time and find out that J. Jonah Jameson is now in charge of the Daily Planet and subsequently, Clark Kent's boss. Why? How? When? all good questions since the comic is gonna take ages to explain it all let me just break it down for you enter plot tool number two a pair of super gods for lack of a better term they're the creators of each individual universe as the story goes these two gods got in a bit of a tussle eons ago that both ended and began all of creation including themselves this clash also caused the splitting of everything into a multiverse, which somehow made them forget about each other's existence until this very moment? Okay. Now that the two gods are aware of each other, they can't stand the idea of not being unique and want nothing more than to destroy the other. Ugh, guys, can't we all just get along? However, they know that full-out combat between them will end both universes. So a tournament of sorts is devised to settle who stays and who gets erased. The rules are simple, one versus one against countless heroes and villains. Whoever immobilizes the other first wins. The universe with the most losses will be erased. Pause, okay, everybody pause. Before we dig into the battles you've been waiting for, I should explain something. Unlike 
our research and science-based approach to superhuman brawls, DC and Marvel decided the best way to decide the victors of these fights was via fan voting. Yeah. In fact, that's the reason you never see us use any of the outcomes of these fights in our character rundowns. Although they do a pretty good job with most of the fights and the reasons character X beats Y. For example, Thor ends up beating Shazam, essentially because Thor can control the lightning that Shazam needs to transform, which I can't confirm without research, but it does seem very plausible. The Flash and Quicksilver fight, and the Flash's superior speed leads him to victory, which is the same conclusion that we came to. Oh, and not that it's much of a surprise, but Robin beats Jubilee without breaking a sweat, and for some reason it ends in some light BDSM. <laughs> so that's a thing. As if this comic wasn't already full of curveballs, DC and Marvel decide to throw us another one. Apparently, two separate Cosmic Guardians have been working behind the scenes the whole time in an attempt to keep either universe from being erased. Not having much luck keeping the universes safe, the two Guardians come together in a last-ditch effort and use their cosmic powers to literally merge the two universes. This, ladies and gentlemen, is how we come to the readily forgotten Amalgam Universe. Something few of us ever asked for, yet here we are. DC and Marvel even made a co-label called Amalgam Comics, where they published standalone issues for all these mashup characters. Now, I will admit some of these, like the Batman-Wolverine mixture that is Dark Claw, turned out kinda cool. They even took both the original character's antagonists, the Joker and Sabretooth, and blended them together to create the Hyena. Silly, but a novel idea. On the other hand, Spider-Boy is on the opposite end of the spectrum. Let me assure you that there aren't really any redeeming aspects inside that standalone comic. Now, I could go on and on and on and on and on and on about the Amalgam Universe, but we'll save that for another episode. Anywho, after 24 Amalgam issues, the universes are separated back out again. Surprise! <laughs> Except not really. I mean, who didn't know that was going to happen? With DC and Marvel properly divided, the two giant space gods have nothing left to do but battle. And our heroes have nothing to do but watch. Quick side note, who the hell drew Cap's face in this panel? I mean, Batman looks plenty befuddled upon witnessing the fight between two galactic gods that will most likely end the existence of all universes! But Captain America, on the other hand, looks like he's high as balls, trying very hard to act natural. <laughs> Ugh. Anyway, being the heroes that they are, Batman and Cap jump into the fray, trying to do anything they can to stop this clash of titans! Despite not being able to affect the gods in any way, shape, or form, they get their attention! And once the gods realize that these two humans are so unique, so much bigger than even themselves, the gods put down their weapons. It's only then that the two deities peer into each other's eyes, inching closer and closer to each other, and then they kiss. No, I'm kidding. They shake hands and say, GG. Now, if you haven't figured it out yet, these two galactic giants are representations of DC and Marvel. And the entire point of this comic is that despite butting heads occasionally, they respect each other. That in and of itself is both equal parts lame and awesome. So at the end of the day, even if this comic is a bit on the nose, it's still a pretty fun read and a cool piece of history. Except for Spider-Boy, that guy is still stupid as hell. Spider-Boy has got to go.